Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started shortly, so we'll just give a, about a minute or two. Get going. Hope everybody's doing well. If you're in Southern Ontario, hope you're enjoying the nice warm weather that we're having. Give another minute. We do have quite a bit of material today, so I want to get started as soon as we can. So, I'm sure more people will start trickling in as we go, but um, might as well get started. Uh, first couple of slides are just sort of housekeeping and agenda, so uh, people won't miss out if they're still joining in. Um, so thanks everybody again for joining us. Um, this is a, a second part in a five part series. So this is on flow and rainfall monitoring, uh, available technology and how to effectively operate and maintain. Um, just a few housekeeping items. So there's a this is, webinar has two parts. Um, so we have a, a presentation and then a Q and A. So as we go through the uh, webinar today, um, there is a Q and A um, button you can press on and type in questions as we go, um, or or at the end you can also type into that window and we will address everything at the end in the Q and A. Um, if you are looking to get uh, PEO P credits for this, um, feel free to reach out to us after the uh, webinar and we'll, we'll be happy to issue a certificate of attendance for this. Um, so the agenda, we'll do a quick intro to Civica, uh, myself and, and also the speakers, the, the gentlemen today that have uh, graciously taken some time to, to speak um, about, about flow and rainfall monitoring. Um, we'll do a quick recap of the part one, very, very uh, brief recap of the last one. Um, we'll, and then we'll jump into the two presentations, uh, the first one about rainfall monitoring, and then the second on flow monitoring, and then finally end uh, with that Q&A. Um, so a little bit about Civica. Uh, so we have, you know, senior staff, lots of uh, people with uh, tons of experience um, in the sort of municipal civil and, and specifically fo focused on a lot of collection system work that we do. Uh, we do a lot of INI and i work, uh, inflow and infiltration, uh, quite a bit of flow monitoring analysis around flow monitoring studies and, and looking at systems uh, from a flow monitoring perspective, uh, asset and capacity management, um, and including modeling, uh, master planning for water, wastewater, stormwater systems, uh, we've been involved in basement flooding studies, surface flood studies, and we do quite a bit of water resource engineering as well. Uh, so just a few photos of some of the other activities that we do. So we have our CCTV vehicle and our flusher truck and, and some staff down a maintenance hole doing uh, rehab work as well. So just wanted to highlight some of the work that we're doing uh, across mostly Southern and, and, and uh, throughout Ontario pretty much. Uh, a little bit about myself and, and most of you, uh, if you've attended webinars in the past, you, you probably have seen my face before, but uh, for those not, um, my name is Matt Malone. I'm a project manager and the VP of business development at Civica. Uh, I have uh, eight plus years of experience in flow monitoring and collection systems, uh, a couple of masters, one in hydrology and an MBA. Uh, I've done consulting, so I've worked with Civica for about six years, and then I have some experience with the region appeal, so a bit on the municipal side as well. I'm currently a new member of the WEO, so the Water Environment Association of Ontario Collection Systems Committee, and I've also been on the WEO Magazine Committee for uh, almost two years, I think now. So just a little bit about me. Uh, we also have two uh, speakers today. So we have Scott Brown. Um, who is a system specialist at uh, Hoskins Scientific. Uh, so Scott is a highly experienced environmental and instrumentation monitoring system specialist. 
with a passion for developing innovative solutions to complex environmental and geotechnical monitoring challenges. Uh, Scott has over 18 years of experience in the field, um, has a, developed a deep understanding of the latest technology into, and techniques in climate and water resource management systems. And Scott's working with multiple municipal partners across Ontario, across Canada, helping them with their rainfall monitoring programs among uh, a lot of the other things that Hoskin does. And then we also have uh, Reverend Dave Walker as well, who's joining us from the UK today. Um, and Dave's the commercial director at uh, Detectronic Limited. Um, Dave began his career in the industry as a field service technician back in 1989, good year. Um, Dave has a background initially in electronics and then he gained a Bachelor of Science uh, from Sheffield, uh, Hallam University in environmental management, uh, and uh, more recently awarded a, a Bachelor of Arts in theology from Sh uh, University of Sheffield. So Dave has been working in the flow survey industry for over 30 years, uh, experience operating flow surveys in UK, Canada, Hong Kong, and Australia. So he's worked in a uh, number of systems, uh, seen tons of challenges, and I'm sure uh, lots of progress in the industry over those years. So pleasure to be joined by these two gentlemen, and you'll hear more from them very shortly. Uh, so just a reminder kind of where we are in the series. So uh, we did part one back in December. Today we're doing part two, and then we'll have another three parts to this flow monitoring webinar series coming out. So keep an eye out on our uh, LinkedIn and, and newsletters so that we can keep you informed about the next uh, the next three parts of the, the series. Um, a quick recap. So last one for so part one, we did sort of the introduction to collection system flow and rainfall monitoring. So we went through the sort of five W's and one H of what those things are. What does it mean to do flow and rainfall monitoring? Uh, I just wanted to highlight, you know, maybe the most important part or one of the most important parts is why we do it. So ultimately, we want to get a, a, a big, a better understanding of what's going on in the natural world and you know natural phenomena. So things we don't control, the rainfall, the climate, how those things are changing over time, having a better understanding of how those things impact our system. Uh, we want to assess our our infrastructure ultimately um, and how they're performing against design expectations. So when we build to a certain standard you know, a 25 year storm or a hundred year storm for a, a piece of infrastructure, let's say, how is it ultimately performing against those expectations? Um, so that's sort of in the here and now, let's say, and then also planning, how do we, how do we make these systems better, this infrastructure, you know, work better for us? How do we accommodate for future growth uh, across a lot of, you know, the Canadian population or, or, or municipal centers, at least, we have a lot of growth that's happening. So how do we accommodate and, and build these systems as sort of efficiently and, and uh, effectively as possible. And any changes in climate, how does this affect? How do we look in, out into the future and plan for, for future changes in, in rainfall events, let's say, and how do we manage our infrastructure and, and ultimately protect the residents and citizens that, that in, you know, at the end of the day, that's why we're doing what we do. So that's sort of a recap of what we did in the past um, webinar why we're doing what we're doing. And then today we'll, we'll jump into some more practical and, uh, and, and, um, and, and listen to some experts on, on what their involvement is in the industry. So with that, I'll pass it over to Scott. And uh, Scott, you should be able to take control and, and uh, get going. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Matt and Civica for the invitation to speak to everybody today. Um, I guess what we'll start with, is we'll just do a, a quick little uh, introduction into, oh, am I controlling it? There we go. There we go. All right, who is, who is Hoskin Scientific? For those on the call, maybe hopefully you're familiar with us, but if not, we're a Canadian owned company. We've been in business for over 75 years here in Canada as a test and monitoring instrumentation supply company. We have a variety of departments where we focus on our uh, our offering uh, in the environmental sector. We have a, a geotechnical monitoring division, what we call a process automation uh, group. We also have an integrated systems group, which is the group that I'm part of. And then uh, we have a rental uh, and service division as well. So a full service company across the board. Uh, we focus 
on some key uh, some key monitoring areas, and specifically with regards to environmental monitoring, we focus in on the meteorological and weather and climate monitoring. We do a lot in water quality and surface water hydrology. We have, uh, we have monitoring instrumentation in groundwater and groundwater remediation applications. We do a fair amount of work in the coastal and oceanographic spaces as well, as well as air quality, limnologies and fisheries and soil and plant science as well. Within our integrated systems division, really what that is, is, is uh, complete turnkey monitoring solutions. Uh, we do a lot of work with municipalities, like Matt mentioned earlier, with regards to precipitation monitoring in real time. Uh, so our focus is on uh, complete automated monitoring applications or systems where we work with our customers from conception to design, construction, and installation to provide a complete monitoring system for your application. Again, the areas of focus that we look at are in the meteorological and climate side of things. We do real-time camera monitoring systems, aquatic health monitoring, water level monitoring, so flood forecasting uh, systems as well. We do some air quality monitoring, some solar renewable energy monitoring, and then obviously, like I said, flow and flood monitoring as well. So the invitation today to speak to everyone was to talk about the, um, the different methods and technologies for monitoring rainfall and precipitation here in Canada. And I think one of the take homes I wanna to give to everybody on the call today is to really to understand what the purpose of your monitoring program really is. And once you define the purpose or the scope of what you're looking to monitor and how the information, how you're gonna take that information and what you're gonna use that information to do, whether it's gonna to be to assess infrastructure capacity, whether it's going to look at um, impacts on uh, you know, natural ecosystems, natural watersheds, or you know, the, the, the buildings, roads and sewers and, and so on and so forth and flow canals. What you really want to understand is, is, is what the point is, right? And, and in Canada, we have a very challenging climate. Uh, we all know it. We live it. Uh, I, I believe most of the people on the call today are Canadian, if I, except for Dave. <laughs> but um, what, we, uh, what you know, we experienced, you know, the four seasons, right? So we're looking at a full gamut in terms of climate, how we deal with different types of precipitation and so on. So today, what I want to talk to you about is two different distinct types of precipitation monitoring, uh, looking at tipping bucket rain gauges or rainfall, so liquid precipitation. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on how to adapt these tipping bucket rain gauges to capture some instances of snowfall through the winter, and then look at the all-season precipitation weighing gauges as a form of capturing all forms of precipitation, snow, sleet, hail, et cetera, and rain. So. Just to start it off as well, I mean, Hoskins Scientific, we represent a variety of different suppliers from interna or internationally, from, from all over the world uh, when it comes to monitoring instrumentation. I'm gonna talk about the HiQuest Solutions TB3 and TB4 tipping buckets today, specifically. They are the Environment Canada or Meteorological Service of Canada standard for rainfall monitoring in Canada. They're also the standard for uh, the US organizations, both on a state and federal level. So these are the gauges that are accepted um, and fed into systems for WMO reporting if you need to go to that level of accuracy and, and, and so on. But we do have a variety of other gauges, uh, tipping bucket rain gauges as well, obviously come at a lower cost point, but also have some drawbacks in terms of their functionality. So with that said, um, you know, basically the TB3, the tipping bucket range gauge, it operates on a tipping bucket principle. So it has a 200 millimeter wide receiver and orifice opening at the top, and it has a 0.2 mil bucket capacity. So really what that means is it can measure anywhere between zero to 700 millimeters of precipitation, of liquid precipitation per hour. And it has a plus or minus 2% calibration accuracy for those intensities from 25 mils all the way up to 500 mils per hour. The design of the gauge itself is designed to operate between minus 20 degrees centigrade and 70 degrees centigrade over its operating span. The only difference really between the TB3 and the TB4 is the TB3, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, has the ability to take on a what we call a low power heater system. And we use that for adaptations of snowfall measurements. The TB4 has a PV, the only difference between the TB3 and the TB4 besides price point is the actual base of the unit. Uh, it's a polymer uh, or an aluminum die cast base on the TB3, so solid aluminum die cast. 
on the TB4, the base, everything about the TB4 is the exact same except for the base, which is UV stabilized PVC base. So literally just looking at two different bases and that makes up the differences between the gauges themselves. Calibration wise, flow wise, siphoning, all operate on the same principle. So uh, what are the characteristics of a tipping bucket? Well, um, this is a good look at the inside of what a tipping bucket looks like. Uh, so the tips of the bucket occur with each 0.2 mils of precipitation collected. So effectively, what you have is a reed switch, and that reed switch is detecting or determining an event. So every time that that tipping bucket moves from one 0.2 mil collected to the next 0.2 mil collected, it has what we call a contact closure. And that contact closure effectively is a logged event. And we calculate those logged events based on how many tips occur. So for every tip is 0.2 mils, you can count the tips and equate that to a total volume of liquid precipitation. One of the key aspects of understanding and collecting rainfall and precipitation data is understanding what a good site is, how and where to collect our precipitation data. So rainfall measurements are intended to be representative of the actual rain falling on a given area. So again, if you're looking at implications for stormwater management ponds, for instance, then ideally you're going to situate a tipping bucket rainfall gauge within that stormwater management pond. Therefore, it's representative of the area in which you are interested in measuring. If you're looking at it from you know, a flood forecasting perspective, for instance, or looking at it from a watershed management perspective, we obviously wanna have our rain gauges located or co-located in the area of interest. One of the things you wanna look at when it comes to site selection is understanding the best site characteristics you can have. The first and foremost is to place the gauge on level ground. Uh, a level gauge is a proper operating gauge. If we noticed on the previous slide, you saw a little bubble level on the gauge itself. That is critical when doing site installation as any influence on not being level will influence the tip of the gauge itself, the actual reed switch and the tip. So you wanna have also adequate protection from strong winds. And as you see in the upper right-hand picture there, we've included what a TB3 would look like with something called an altar shield. And an altar shield ultimately protects against any lateral wind displacement of falling precipitation in the gauge. What that does, it creates a bit of a, a shield or a, a protection area around the collection area of the tipping bucket so as to allow you to collect and, 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 and report uh, real-time precipitation as best representative of the field given the local conditions. You also wanna make sure that you are free of large obstructions such as buildings and trees. And you wanna make sure that you have uh, suitable ground surface clearance so you avoid any splashing. Obviously you look at the picture on the bottom, uh, you'll see it's about a meter off the ground, give or take. The idea behind that is that we're not gonna have any, like I said, rebound or bouncing or splashing of the water back into the gauge itself. The electrical components on a TB3 and TB4 and basically um, uh, any tipping bucket range gauge is a, a reed switch. The distinguishing factor of a TB3 and a TB4 is the dual reed switch option for the rain gauge. What this is, is basically two isolated switches which permit the control of two separate circuits. So you could have a localized logging component that would log the, the, every tip uh, locally. And then you could have the second reed switch go in and, um, and connect to a telemetry circuit. So you could configure that to connect to a data logger, a modem, and have that data report out in real time. So what the TB3 and the TB4 do is they provide that read switch, but they provide two isolated read switches to give you dual reporting or dual channels out. So a nice added feature above other tipping buckets on the market. And one of the questions we always get asked is about maintenance and operations. Um, the nice part about tipping bucket rain gauges is the maintenance is, is pretty, pretty straightforward. You need to clean the gauge. Um, obviously, you know, different types of litter and debris, uh, leaf litter, um, you know, uh, bird droppings, all of those types of things can go in and influence the collection orifice and the collection capacity of a rain gauge. So a typical uh, maintenance and operations schedule for these, these, uh, these, these gauges is, is, is merely cleaning the gauges themselves. So um, yeah, 
you want to make sure and using the gauges, all you need is isopropyl alcohol. That is the only recommended uh, piece of material to you uh, or to, to clean the gauges. And what we're going to clean is we're going to clean the catch filters. We're going to clean the siphons. We're going to clean the interior of the bucket, the top surface of the adjustment screws, any enclosure locking screws, and basically all insect screens or in, uh, any protection areas within the gauge that would, that would uh, inhibit any flow through the actual siphon and funnel. So what does the siphon maintenance on a TB3 and a TB4 look like? Well, I mean, basically it's unscrewing uh, a nut and then pulling out the siphon filter right out of the tipping bucket. So it actually takes about a minute and a half to do a full maintenance schedule on a TB3. So one of the questions we get asked a lot from our customers is, you know, how often do I need to go? And it's really dependent on site location. If you have a, if you're, you know, got a precipitation gauge that's in a deciduous needle or, um, sorry, a, a coniferous forest, for instance, obviously you're going to have some conifer needles that would fill up that tipping bucket potentially uh, quicker than you would in a deciduous forest, and so on and so forth. So it's really dependent on the local site conditions and what that debris would look like. But the best operating tipping bucket range gauge is a clean tipping bucket rain gauge. So the other nice part about the TB3 and TB4 is the calibration process. Um, these are their specified accuracy of a plus or minus 2% for the first zero to 100 mils on the tipping bucket rain gauge. And the TB3 and TB4 are designed to hold their calibration for 100,000 measurements or 100,000 events. Okay. So Effectively, what that is, is we're talking, we're looking at a very long time in terms of precipitation calibration. Um, so prior to conducting a calibration, you need to thoroughly clean the gauge. Because if you are going to calibrate this gauge, you want to make sure that all inhibited or all any dirt, any dust, any leaf debris, any, any, any aspects of the gauge that could inhibit flow will be removed. And oftentimes, most often, cleaning a gauge from top to bottom, as suggested before, will actually bring the TB3 back into calibration without having to use the calibration device. But if you need to get to the calibration device, this is the calibration device that you can get with the TB3. It is, uh, it is done in the field, so you do not need to remove the gauge from the field. Ultimately, what happens is you have, um, uh, you know, you fill the, uh, the, the field calibration device with water, and you place it in top of the rain gauge and you open the breathing tube at the top. And basically what you do is you count the tips as the water drains through. There are different calibration volumes for your unit, depending on what, what, what window of calibration you need. The most typical is a 653 milli milliliter uh, calibration device, which is shown here in the picture. So basically we count the, the, count the, uh, the total tips using a, either, you know, you can count them manually if you want to, or you can connect them to a data logger and count them and log them with a data logger. And effectively, after 104 tips, uh, you should have totally evacuated a 653 milliliter uh, field calibration device, which should take approximately 12 minutes to run from a full calibration procedure on the TB3. The nice part about this, like I said, done in the field, you do not need to remove the gauge from the, uh, the field. It can be done right in situ. Going back to the original point about understanding and defining the scope of the precipitation you're going to be measuring, uh, the TB3 has the ability to in, uh, implement what we call a low power heater kit. Now, the idea behind the low power heater kit is uh, that any collection, any collected snow and ice that's found within the tipping bucket uh, opening uh, receiver uh, can be melted out uh, and, and then create or converted from the melt into a liquid precipitation and counted through the tipping bucket mechanism. So the idea of the design of this snow and ice uh, low power heater kit is to operate between minus 20 degrees centigrade and five degrees centigrade. Uh, the, we can control the snow sensor and the heater itself through community or uh, the common SDI 12 communications protocol. So you would need a data logger to do that. And the factory preset on the heater comes preset to operate between minus 15 and plus five degrees centigrade. So ultimately, the heating unit looks like this. So ultimately, what you have is a snow sensor that's built into the inner wall of the tipping bucket and a block heater or block temperature sensor. And then a funneling heater unit that is built and encompasses the entire lower portion of the actual funnel of the tipping bucket. You've got an ambient temp temperature sensor and a status LED light here, and then a lower heating block for the bucket itself down here. So ultimately, 
without diving too deep into it, what happens is, is if this snow sensor is covered by snow uh, and longer for a prolonged period of time, and the temperature from the ambient temperature sensor is below five degrees centigrade, the heater will turn on. And that heater will turn on for 18 minutes and operate and melt out any snow that has fallen into the tipping bucket receiver in that time period. Once that 18 minutes is up, the heater turns itself off and it is reinitiated when those two conditions mm. are reestablished. So if the sensor is blocked or has snow over top of it and the temperature is below five degrees centigrade. So the idea behind the heating tipping bucket is to give you a rough estimation of snowfall in the area. It is not meant as an absolute gauge for snow. There are some conditions, um, there are some timing issues with the low power heater kit. And if snow <clears throat> is a major concern for you, then what we need to do is we need to look at other options for gauging instrumentation. And those other options for gauging instrumentation, we move over to something like the, um, the odd hydromet offering, which is a family of precipitation gauges that are effectively all season weighing precipitation gauges. Now there are a few different models um, based on, solely on the anticipated level or total volume of precipitation you're gonna get in the year and the type of precipitation you're gonna get. For Southern Ontario, we typically um, sell the, uh, the Pluvio L, the 200 CM model. But what the difference between a tipping bucket and a weighing gauge is, is effectively a precipitation gauge using the weighing principle. So it's measuring all forms of precipitation. It's measuring liquid, solid, and mixed precipitation. It has the ability for advanced data acquisition and processing with signal analysis. It does filtering and it does noise reduction to provide you with highly accurate results for for small events up to large scale, heavy or high precipitation events. It has the ability to have algorithms for compensation on temperature influences and wind influences on the gauge itself. Uh, it is lifetime calibrated. It's a nice feature. Uh, it, like I said, it has the ability to, 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 to do ice and drift and almost and is basically a maintenance free gauge. I will talk about some aspects some minor aspects of maintenance, but overall, the argument is, is that it's a low cost of ownership and a high data availability. So what does a pluvial weighing gauge look like? Well, this is effectively on the left hand side, a fully organized, fully uh, uh, commissioned uh, pluvial weighing gauge. But what you see are the components of that weighing gauge. So what it involves is a total bucket. This bucket is collecting precipitation that falls into the orifice at the top. This area at the top here has the potential to have a ring heater. And I'll talk a little bit about the ring heater in the next couple of slides. But ultimately what's happening is, is there's a big scale at the bottom with four load cells. And those load cells are on each of the four corners of this base. And so ultimately it is taking a displacement or a weight displacement of that gauge and equating the total volume of precipitation that falls as it's distributed over those four load cells. In Canada, we run into snow and ice regularly. So one of the options with the Pluvio is to involve a ring heater. And what that ring heater does is ultimately protect against any snow capping. Typically in Canada, we see snow capping in locations, um, mostly in the mountains on the West Coast. So British Columbia, Alberta, the Rockies in Alberta and Yukon will see snow capping. In Southern Ontario, in uh, Northern Ontario, Quebec and Eastern Canada, we tend not to see snow capping too much. Really what snow capping is meant to do is if we have a high precipitation rate of a very um, uh, uh, large flake uh, uh, distribution of snowfall, Ultimately, what happens is, is it, it can potentially clog or, or block up the actual orifice on the top of the precipitation gauge. So only the metal ring, the upper metal ring of the pluvio is heated. This does also prevent some surface evaporation from happening from the bucket underneath. And those sensors, um, the, the ring heater control and the temperature sensor themselves are installed within the pipe housing underneath the pluvio itself. We don't recommend using a ring heater on a Pluvio on a DC supplied system. It is pretty power hungry, uh, as you see 50 watts at 24 volts. So we recommend an AC supply on site if you need to go with a ring heater unit on a Pluvio. What this does do is it does allow you to collect precipitation from minus 40 degrees centigrade to plus 60. 
Okay, so um, that is, uh, and one of the neat aspects of the Pluvio is the amount of information you get out of it. Now the Pluvio has really two outputs. It has what we call a real-time output and a non-real-time output. And the real-time output is defined on the Pluvio's output within one minute, as soon as the intensities are above 0.1 millimeters per minute. So what's the advantage of that? Well, you get fast intensity corrected precipitation outputs from the Pluvio in real time. The non-real-time output, basically those output of the measurements results in five minutes after the occurrence of a precipitation event. So what's the advantage of that? You have precise quantitative precipitation output in a calculated uh, bin of data, which can be then logged and, 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 uh, and accounted for in a real-time uh, telemetry system. So the information you get out of the Pluvio uh, is uh, the intensity of the precipitation event, the quantity, both in real time and non-real time. Um, since the last measured value, you get total. Um, the nice part about it is you also get the total bucket capacity. And as many people I'm sure are going to ask the question, but there's a bucket. And that is the maintenance aspect of this is every once in a while, depending on how much precipitation you get, you need to empty the bucket. So we always recommend collecting the total NRT value because the total NRT value is ultimately the total volume of precipitation or liquid sitting inside the bucket. So you can actually create an alarm on a real-time system and it'll tell you when the next maintenance, when you need to go out and do maintenance because it'll be telling you it, you know, the bucket is full effectively. So, and then if you have a telemetry system like that, you can configure alarms based on individual parameters and so on to actually send you emails and text messages and all the ways that we can report in real time and, and let you know in the middle of the night that your tipping bucket has you know challenges or precipitation has challenges. But ultimately, um, that is two of the main precipitation methods that we have at Hoskins Scientific that um, we sell and provide into municipal monitoring applications. We have other technologies as well. We have distrometers. We have um, which look at, uh, at uh, precipitation classifications can actually break down whether it's hail or grapple or ice or snow, and then total volumes based on those. But from the municipality and 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 where the where we're talking about today with regards to flow, these are the two main technologies that we sell into Canada for precipitation monitoring. So, with that, I think I will pass it on to Dave. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. I'll just go back one. Dave, will pass it over to you. I know there's a couple of questions already, okay. Scott, but we'll, uh, we'll leave those to the end. All right, Dave, over to you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Thanks, uh, Scott. So uh, I'm uh, Reverend Dave Walker, Commercial Director at D-Tetronic. And uh, so quick background of D-Tetronic. Um, we're a manufacturer and supplier of level and velocity and flow me measurement equipment. We've been doing that and research dating back way back to 1974. The uh, recent past 45 years has been primarily involved with manufacturing area velocity flow measurement. And just recently, over the past three or four years, uh, there's been a new development in, um, in flow and level measurement in sewers, and that's looking at smart sewer networks. So we've developed technology for that area as well, which we will touch on that. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to run through some of these slides at uh, um, about 20 minutes of your time, and that will hopefully give us uh, some good time for uh, any questions and answers to, to go on. Okay, and I've got Matt in the background there to just give me a thumbs up if I'm uh, running over a bit too much. Sounds okay. good. Okay, so tools for flow measurement. One of the best tools in the market is a stick. You throw it in the river, and they all win in a poo. You put it on the river there and, uh, and time it. And we're still using that. As well as back in Canada in the uh, early 90s, I uh, was working with uh, people, uh, probably were at Civica now as well, is using oranges. Now, a thing with an orange, you put the orange in the actual open channel flow and it drops down to about one third of the way in from the surface, which is where the actual average velocity. So oranges are great as well. And they oh, make great Christmas decorations as well. I want to first touch on more scientific based approach for flow measurement, and that's using what we call primary devices, flumes and weirs. So this is where you actually obstruct the actual flow, create some form of restriction, 
are in uh, an actual vortex or a, a flume. And we're looking at the change in hydraulic head. And that change in hydraulic head is somewhere proportioned to the actual flow coming through using one or two different, kind of, um, different formulas. Next type of tool we want to uh, be looking at is uh, another one what's been it's in the uh, uh, market for a measuring of open channel flow measurement some time now, and that's non-contact radar. There's also a laser out there as well, non-contact laser. That's a great tool. And all these tools, even the primary devices we've just talked about, using just level only to calculate flow, they all have a great place. But everything has its limitations. Um, hopefully on the next slide, I'm just going to show you some limitations bravely, yeah, bravely using video of uh, the change in surface conditions of the actual radar measurement. Let's see if this works here. This, so this is on one of the test rigs at DTEKTRONIC. And this is where we've got normal steady hydraulic flow. And just want to just show that of the actual pattern. You can see that it was quite steady. And I can't show it again, but I'll go on to this one. But that steady flow, we were getting plus or minus 5% error from the actual radar device. Now here, we've actually put an obstruction just upstream of the radar device, just to give a bit more turbulence on the actual surface ripple on, on this channel. So I'll have a look at see if this one comes through. There we go. And so you can see that there's not a great deal of ripple or change, but that change in velocity profile created an error of 34%. So where I'm going with this is I just want to uh, make ourselves aware that these are great technologies, but we, know, we need to know where the limitations lie. And as long as we work within that limitation and we understand it, we can actually get some really good flow measurement. So the device uh, really uh, I want to focus on a bit more here is the inserted area velocity flow meter. This uses uh, ultrasonic Doppler for velocity. And it uses pressure for me measuring the wetted cross-sectional area. Multiply those two parameters together using what's known as the continuity equation. We can determine flow. Maintenance side of uh, this before we start going into limitations is here on the uh, left-hand side of the unit is what's called a breather device. This is a desiccant tube, basically. For that pressure sensor to work accurately, we don't want any moisture to go into that actual tube. It's a very fine tube, so it is protected by using a breather arrangement. So that breather arrangement is a desiccant tube, and that has to be replaced as and when the, those desiccants get saturated. Just below here is the battery pack. So some uh, manufacturers will uh, supply with uh, a non-rechargeable battery pack where it's a disposable battery and, and throw away. Detectronic went with a pioneering route of designing its an ATEX, uh, i.e. ECX certified battery device, which is rechargeable. So typically on charging rates, if you're logging every five minutes of level and velocity, you would actually expect to achieve and about 10 months battery before you need to replace that battery. Secondly, on the, well, thirdly on maintenance, which is very last, is just underneath the velocity sensor here is a capillary hole, what uh, brings the pressure into the actual pressure sensor. Depending on uh, where we're at within the wastewater sewer network, that itself might occasionally get blocked. And so it also needs a clean as well. You'll know when that needs cleaning because you will see changes in the actual hydraulic level, and that can be picked up using various scatter plots. Now, I know Civic are, are going to be talking about data and how to analyze data in one of the next uh, run of the, uh, the series, so we'll leave that one there. Just going to bring this back onto the hydraulic side of it. And as you can see here, uh, so this is the ultrasonic Doppler transmitting at around about one megahertz. And we 
with Doppler, it works fantastic, especially continuous wave Doppler, because it spreads way into the channel. And if we're looking at uh, wastewater, i.e. municipality, domestic wastewater, you're looking round about anywhere between three to five feet in front of the actual sensor. So that's great because we're getting good velocity profile and we'll touch on velocity profiling in a bit. Now, when we're at very low levels, high 25 millimeters, but high velocity, we can get what is called a hydraulic wave, what we can just see here going over the sensor. That can cause us a bit of a problem. So what we need to be doing is actually looking at the level here rather than back at the, uh, of the sensor itself. And so the next slide actually shows us this. So this is where we need to be taking the level reading at this point and not from the pressure sensor. So again, if you've got high velocity but very low level, you can get this hydraulic wave, which would give you an error in the reading. So we overcome that one by actually putting an ultrasonic level sensor in. And this is actually now picking up that level in front of the velocity sensor. So again, it's understanding limitations of technology. And you might have seen the way the velocity sensor was uh, shaped. That was specifically designed to create, to remove some of the vortex shedding. So at most uh, cases around about 25 millimeter in depth, around about 0.2 meters per second up to around about 0.8 meters per second. The shape and the design, the ergonomics of the velocity sensor combats most of that vortex shedding. But ultimately, if you've got a level of around about 25 mil, an inch, one inch deep, but high velocity of one and a half, one and a half, two meters per second, and you will get that wave effect and you need to put an additional sensor onto the unit. Okay. So just looking beyond the numbers here, this is a, a, a test we did uh, against uh, what, so over here it's the Environment Agency and uh, the Environment Agency um, have a certification scheme where we have to test against in this case, a flu. So we were doing a calibration against a primary device. And if we can just go through here, one of the first key areas, what we need to do when we're comparing data against another unit is look at the granulation of data. If you've got something logging data at two minutes and something logging data at 15 minutes, then you'll be amazed the actual errors, what you can actually get associated with, with that level and it can be around about 17 percent error in certain cases in this particular case we're looking at near on plus 24 percent error purely between two instruments based in the same channel so it's very important that one we get the actual data logging the intervals like for like because that averaging can actually create quite a wide scope now, not only uh, was we getting error from um, a mismatch of data and, until we brought the two data sets into the same time domain, downstream of that flume, because it was a primary device, we were getting surcharging or drowning. And that was actually seen here with a watermark downstream. So you could see where the pressure was coming in. And just downstream of the primary device, in placing whales here in the, in the UK. And that was at high tide, sorry, high tide, high flows, that it was actually backing up into the uh, sewer chamber and into the flume, giving us false reading. So it's important to understand the limitations of primary device against area velocity and vice versa. And again, just downstream of the uh, flume tell, telltale signs here showing that we've got a, a backup and a, a drowning effect quite often. So that's without even putting instrumentation in. That's just physically looking at what the uh, environment is telling us. 
Skewed flows is another one, and this is shown on the on the next slide actually. So skewed flows. Here we've got the velocity profile. You see the bottom corners there of that velocity profile. That's just dead uh, flow. That's um, what we call reverse eddy currents. So they're not going anywhere. The actual average there is in the middle now. When we're taking secondary velocity readings, you would take secondary velocity readings over the profile of the actual channel. But in this case, if we took those red lines into consideration there, they would actually give us a, a false calibration reading. And this is shown here in this data set. So if you can see that the actual data was showing 39.7 meters per second, whereas if we'd have done the full cross-sectional profile of that channel, we'd have actually been under reading by 36 liters, but, but, but not by 36 liters, but the difference between 36 and the 39 liters per second. So again, what I'm showing there is it's not only about the instrumentation, it's about the environment where we're doing background calibrations, QA, QC checks. So it's important that we, we know what we're looking at, especially with skewed flow and velocity profiling. And again, so uh, advanced your continuous wave Doppler, because it spreads out on a, an actual trajectory, then we're right in the middle of that velocity profile within the channel. So continuous wave Doppler does have a great advantage when uh, looking at open channel flow monitoring, sewer network monitoring, etc. And again, that's just showing that data on how the actual velocity trajectory works within the actual forward facing looking Doppler. So again, without actually any instrumentation, have a look what's actually on site or around you, see what other information you get. On that particular site, what you looked at, we, we looked at earlier, we got 18,000 meters cubed coming in, uh, uh, going out of the outlet, and we'd only got 15,000 cubic meters a day coming into the inlet. So that in itself is showing that we got these errors, and that's where the, the, there was an error in the hydraulic profiling of the flume. And another area of what we, uh, we experienced on that particular site was from the equation of Bernoulli, is working on actual increased pressure and pressure drop throughout the channel. So let me just see if we can, yeah, we'll done that two slides too much now. There we go. So this effectively, it's uh, the principle of the jet engine. So that pipe where we saw it actually surcharging, watermark was, is what's happening here through Bernoulli is it's actually picking up the uh, velocity and it's pulling the velocity through this section of P4 and actually increasing the velocity because of the actual pressure differentiation. So now over at the flume, we've got an underread on the actual flume rather than an overread. So again, it's about uh, the ac actual applications and the sites, what we're looking at. Yeah? If this section was continuous and going straight out into the river, providing it was free flowing, there'd have been no issue. But because it's actually being forced through this sector, if you like, got another flume, you've got this increase in velocity. So again, another area of concern where you just need to be a bit careful. And that was represented here in the pulsating flow resulting in velocity spikes. So the velocity spikes just showing that the, the velocity is increasing, then decreasing, increasing. Then. You might think, uh, well, is that a pumped flow? Well, no, it isn't because if it was a pumped flow regime, those peaks and troughs would be very similar in am amplitude. So that's actually showing us uh, this was uh, an effect of Bernoulli, given uh, an underread on that open channel measurement device, the primary. Now, for using the area of velocity, that didn't matter because we were picking up the wetted cross sectional area and the true velocity using the continuous wave Doppler. So that's where we were able to prove using area velocity uh, what the actual true 
flow rates were. Now, finally, just uh, in the ne next five minutes, uh, as I'm coming to a close now, I want to talk about smart sewer network monitoring. So when I first opened up with the talk, I mentioned that, you know, for the past 45 years, we've been doing area velocity flow monitoring uh, throughout the world. And we've, that, we've always driven that because it's a great tool. You've got the, uh, the cross-sectional area, you've got the velocity, you've got so much information coming back from an area velocity flow monitor, ideal for modeling sewer networks, et cetera. Uh, but can we do anything more with ice? And when we're looking at lower costs, now that the last level, can we do anything with just monitoring the level? So here, we, uh, because when a client or a municipality comes to you and says, I want to put 9,000 monitors in the sewer, we put our arms around these people and say, yes, 9,000 flow monitors, but oh no, I, I, want, I don't want to pay that much. I don't want to pay all pay a lot less. So 9,000 sewer level monitors. And this is where the UK has been driven over the past three or four years, actually. So this particular area uh, in southwest of England, 1.76 million residents, 4,000 square miles of uh, sewer, uh, well, uh, uh, actual area, and 730 miles of coastline. That particular area is the biggest coastline, believe it or not, for any uh, county within uh, the UK. Working out of 14,000, well, just in 15,000 kilometers of sewers and 800 sewer pumping stations, how do you make a smart sewer network monitoring program? So level is a great tool, but ultrasonic, that's fantastic. And just quickly on the limitations of ultrasonics, we have what's called a dead band and a beam spread. So great because it's non-contact, but you do have the off uh, the uh, the area where once it goes into that dead band, it's it switches off. Likewise, because of the beam spread, is if you've got that mounted too far away, the beam spread on one meter transmission is typically about 200 millimeters. So you've got a 150, a six inch diameter pipe, and it's going to be bouncing all over the bench in there, and you're going to get errors. So the other way is put a pressure sensor in, in the channel. Well, that's great, but as we mentioned earlier, it's contact, it's got to be in contact with the flow, and typically it's got to be uh, reference to atmosphere or it's going to drift. So about three years ago, Detectronic worked on a research program to actually say, well, these two devices are great, how can we combine them together? And that's what we did, and uh, we got patent to, uh, uh, a patent applied on this particular process. So what's happening is the ultrasonic in its, is to be mounted as close as we can to the actual target of measurement. That way we're getting great energy coming back. But we have got that limitation again, as I said, as it goes into the dead band, the ultrasonic will switch off. So whilst the ultrasonic is, in, is leading and it's taking those accurate level measurements, in the background it's calibrating the pressure sensor. Now the pressure sensor could be way out, and the ultrasonic's pretty much saying to the pressure sensor, I don't care what you're saying, this is a true level. And it will continue to calibrate the level sensor whilst it's giving data back to the data logger, which is the, the LIDOT smart logger. And then just before it starts entering its dead band, it will then actually switch to the pressure sensor and say, right, you're calibrated, you can go on from now, ultrasonic starts to switch off, the pressure sensor continues for another 30 feet. So we can, we've got a sim, single sensor using two sensor technologies with this patented uh, approach. And that way, we're, uh, uh, we're able to design a product, cell power, this product will run for seven years on its, uh, on its battery before needing replacement of the battery and it's logging uh, around about five minutes and then sending the data either on an hourly upload or on a daily upload, depending on uh, what, what software packages we're using and forecasting. So we've got these in within those sewer networks and we're able to forecast through some other clever algorithms to say what's going to be happening in three or four days time 
with various weather patterns coming through, which then informs the water company, the municipality, of what steps to take going forward. Then this, all this information comes back to uh, data centers. We've got a data center here, here at uh, DTechtronic, bringing in all those thousands of devices, reporting back to the water companies. Something which uh, I've worked closely with Civic on over the years and bringing it into their platforms. Uh, that's uh, how we can start controlling a sewer network and actually and the terminology of smart sewer networks. So flood blockages, ongoing data screening, data analytics and interpretation, and alarm strategy development, technical support, all brings us into what was and um, what is now uh, a lead in smart sewer network. So hopefully I was in time then. It's given everybody a bit of food for thought and uh, back over to you, Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I think that was really great. We, uh, we have about five minutes left, so I'll just do uh, a quick reminder, everybody. Uh, hopefully you found parts one and two enjoyable and, and learned something today. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, keep an eye out for our future webinars. Um, you know, as both Scott and Dave mentioned, we'll get into more around the quality um, and analysis, uh, you know, you're pulling in flow data from hundreds or thousands of monitor. So, um, that's one challenge, but then how do you ensure that you're getting good quality data and what are you ultimately doing with that data? So that's what we're kind of digging into over the next uh, few parts of the webinars. So keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah, with that, we'll say thank you. Uh, hopefully, if, if I think there are a few questions already, um, feel free to type in any questions. If, if those of you that want to stick around and, and ask questions, feel free to do so. Uh, happy to stick around. And um, yeah, then maybe we can we can queue some up for, uh, for, for, for Dave and, and for Scott here, any questions that are out here. So I'll just open the Q&A. Um, uh, it seems like some of these have been answered. <laughs> I kind of went through and answered some of them already. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, I did promise an anecdote to VJ, so I'll tell him. I'll tell him a bit of a story in my answer. So, uh, VJ's question was revolving around whether to set up the TB3, TB4 series tipping buckets in an urban setting environment, and then whether to do it on top of buildings and towers. Obviously, what you want to look at is the influence of horizontal and vertical wind flow on those gauges uh and and then you know that is obviously dependent on the structure of the building the type of building and obviously the height of the building uh the story uh i will the municipality shall rename nameless but i've done many installs over the years and i was asked on one particular install to place the tipping bucket on the top of a building that was 13 or 14 stories tall and next to the building's evaporator which, as you can imagine, blows <laughs> vertical air directly upwards. So after con some convincing and teaching them an understanding, uh, giving them an understanding of how the gauge works and why the gauge works like that, we found a nice site on the second floor of a building two blocks down the way where we installed the gauge there, and it was uh, more highly appropriate for the type of instrumentation and type of data they were after. So you always want to know and always want to understand what's going on on the roof of a building. Um, and different factors at play, and uh, and then obviously how that influences the data collector to the precipitation as it falls in the area of concern. So, awesome, yeah, that was one question. I think that came up in our last webinar as well, um, and something I was going to get you to elaborate on, Scott. So that's great that uh, that question came up. Um, there was a question around you know purchasing, installing, and maintaining their own gauges, which I saw, um, Scott, you answered that. You know, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I would say it's also the same um, for flow meters. You, you know, most municipalities, I say these, I would say these days are renting and getting a contractor to go out and install and maintain that equipment. There are some exceptions. Um, there are municipalities that are um, buying and servicing their own flow meters or buying them and just hiring a, a consultant to maintain the meters on their behalf. Um, so there, there are some cases where that's happening, at least in Southern Ontario. 
Um, and then there are, uh, I would say majority of them are renting them through some sort of flow monitoring and, and rainfall monitoring program that, that they're getting that equipment provided as part of that service. So um, yeah, that just to elaborate a little bit on that, that question. Um, there's a question about uh, sensors inc incorporate temperature sensing. I don't, I, I guess that may be more along the lines for you, Dave, because I think Scott yeah. clearly talked about temperature monitoring and sensors. Um, so I guess, Dave, if you can talk about temperature sense, uh, sensors. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I perhaps overlooked that in the, in the talk there. Is, uh, so within the um, area velocity sensor, there's a, a temperature sensor as well which actually picks up uh, water temperature or uh, effluent temperature. So that actually works great actually as a tool for I&I &I, uh, in investigation, or specifically uh, doing the QAQC against I&I &I if it's uh, rainfall, snow melt runoff in, into the sewer. Temperature of the liquid is really useful. So that gets logged now as standard on the MSFM 2.5T. With the uh, LIDOT, what can also be connected to the um, MSFM 2.5T is that actually monitors ambient temperature as well. So uh, yeah, it's quite interesting monitoring ambient temperature as well. It doesn't give you as much information as the uh, temperature of the actual liquid what's being monitored, uh, but it gives you uh, some of uh, good ideas as well. So, so yeah, important to have temperature standard on a flow monitor these days. Great. Awesome. And, and if I can jump in um, with regards to precipitation monitoring, the secondary gauge, the Pluvio, the second gauge that I spoke of has an output for ambient air temperature as well. The TB3, the tipping bucket does not. So you would have to okay. include a secondary temperature sensor. There is an ambient temperature sensor built into the low heater power kit but it does not have an output. It's just meant to control the actual heater itself. So for a tipping bucket rain gauge, you would want to incorporate an air temperature sensor as well, but for the Pluvio, you would be able to get temperature off of that sensor as well. So. Awesome. Um, I guess something that came up and we talked a little bit about this earlier, Scott, is, is sort of the next step in, in rainfall monitoring and trying to incorporate the radar and sort of gauge adjusted radar rainfall and all that. I don't know if like, it's probably open, but it's like sort of open question around your thoughts around that and how the work that you guys do and the products you sell can be you know, I mean, used and leveraged with those types of systems. I mean, I've always been a proponent of the way to validate model data and, 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 and spatially corrected data is to have Boot, you know, boots on the ground, right? You're only going to model and validate that data collected if you have instrumentation on the ground, uh, you know, a good spatial distribution of a monitoring network to really capture. Again, it goes back to the question you're asking, right? And, and the type of monitoring that you're looking for. I mean, if you're looking at storm flow monitoring and only the impacts of storm flow uh, pond or storm flow monitoring, storm water ponds, that kind of thing, you know, maybe you need to design your network you know, solely around the co-location of, of gauges within those stormwater network areas, right? Um, using something like gauge-adjusted radar is, I mean, it's a great tool. It really is. And, and but again, that tool is, is made only better by the validation of real-time collected data on, from the field. Um, you know, there are, there are, uh, there are limitations to what you get from a radar sensor. And I mean, we have our own, you know, unique offering of radar sensors as well. I mean, we have precipitation gauges that are based off of radar. Um, they uh, they have their challenges. I will say that. Um, in the Canadian environment, snow and ice is not your friend. And so, <laughs> from a radar operating perspective, and I'm sure Dave can appreciate that as well. From the radar side, ice is not your friend. So, um, it is uh, it is one of the challenges, especially. And again, it comes down, like I said at the beginning, it's the scope and understanding you know, what you're after, what's the important data, where, what, what your network is going to, how your network is going to benefit from the data collected, right? If you right. only need, I think I said this to you uh, the other day, that the only, if you only really need liquid water because you're only concerned about liquid flow in a, ch in a, in a channel, then you don't need to spend the money on a, you know, a, a precipitation gauge that is going to collect snow. It's not of interest to you. 
But if you are after a year-round operating system and year-round responses to these systems, then you need to look at something like that. So it's it really is, it just goes back to the beginning of being able to define scope and define what the point of the measurement and point of the monitoring system is. So Right. And I'm sure you're happy to talk to people about the scope of work that they're trying to achieve. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's... Anybody that's wants what... to reach out to Scott, feel free to do so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We can, yeah. we can definitely help with that as well. So. Um, I guess, uh, Dave, for one of the questions that I came up with and you, you touched on the, you, you know, 9,000 flow meters or, or, or level sensors. And I don't know if you yeah. can maybe just comment on, um, you know, maybe having some flow meters, uh, like how do you how do you come up with the plan if it's 9,000 or 900 meters? Do you want some yeah. proportion of those that are AV and then level only to balance that, you know, data collection and accuracy with the cost. And uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how you make a decision yeah. around that. Absolutely. Well, again, it's uh, going back to Scott's uh, mentioning of scope. It's, it's about understanding the scope and what is required here. Uh, using the UK as an example is uh, we've got 15,000 combined sewer overflows throughout the UK. All right. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, and again, our sewer system's aging, you know, and, and I know your guys in, in Canada, you've got some old sewers, but we've got some old sewers going 120 years old uh, and more. Well, in order to actually replace the uh, sewer network here in the UK, we're looking at around about 400 billion pounds. Yeah, I'll not do the conversion into, into dollars, but, but about 400 billion pounds. So, it's been uh, put onto the municipalities that, well, actually, we should be monitoring uh, and managing our sewer networks better and be smarter about the smart network. So this is where we are it's balancing that fine line against doing the hydraulic modeling, which is area velocity flow measurement. That's still got to go on, and that's still got to be continued because we've got to do the hydraulic sewer modeling. But by having a mix then of thousands of level devices throughout the sewer network, that gives us this um, and what we can actually now work with to actually see what's actually happening within the sewer, the sewer network and are we managing it smartly. So and we, I mean, I've got an algorithm, believe it or not, of how many sewers you'd need uh, upstream of downstream of a discharge. Typically, uh, very crudely, it's 10. You need... 10 level monitors for every overflow or every discharge into a uh, open open water course. Yeah, that does vary then against densities and populations. So there's a bit more science behind it than that. But typically, you need 10, 10 level monitors in a sewer network, and then using the area velocity flow monitoring principles of modeling, et cetera, to actually drill further down and uh, and understand what's happening. Oh, again, if anybody does want to actually speak more about the science behind all that, then uh, please do get in touch. And uh, we can that that's going to be one of those events on its own, mate. Yeah, <laughs> that'll take you the next one. <laughs> sure, you could speak for quite a bit of time just on that. So, you're right there. Mm. Um, okay, I don't see any Absolutely. more questions in the Q and A. We can uh, just, I mean, I'm happy, I'm sure these guys are happy to stick around for a couple more minutes. Um, once again, thanks to everybody for coming out. Great, uh, great showing today. So really happy that everybody joined.